Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. My name is Farnaz Kadem. I'm Stanford's Vice President for University Communications, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this press conference in honor of our newest Nobel laureates, Professors Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson. This morning, Professors Milgram and Wilson were named as the winners of the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel for, quote, improvements to auction theory and inventions of new auction formats. Today, we have with us Mark Tessier-Levine, president of Stanford University, Jonathan Levin, dean of the Graduate School of Business, Deborah Satz, dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences, and of course, our laureates, professors Milgram and Wilson. Before we get to your questions, we will start with a few remarks from our speakers. And for members of the media in our audience, if you have not already done so, please submit your questions now. We will get to as many of them as we can, and a recording of this discussion will also be available at the conclusion of the conference. And now I would like to turn it over to President Tessia Levine to provide some comments. Mark. Well, thank you very much, Farnaz, and good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us as we congratulate Bob Wilson and Paul Milgram for their remarkable achievements in economics. All of us at Stanford are so proud of Professor Wilson and Professor Milgram, and we're delighted that their accomplishments have been recognized by the Nobel Committee. Bob Wilson and Paul Milgram have each made important theoretical discoveries with significant real-world implications. Bob Wilson was the first to create a framework for auctions of items with a common value. Paul Milgram played a leading role in developing the theory of auctions when bidders have both common and private values. The two have collaborated closely for years. In fact, Paul Milgram first began to develop his theories as a doctoral student of Bob Wilson. He wasn't the first of Bob's students to win the prize though, as prior Nobel laureates Bengt Holmstrom and Alvin Roth were also doctoral students of Professor Wilson. And Bob and Paul are neighbors as well as colleagues. As I understand it, Paul found out they'd won the Nobel Prize when Bob crossed the street to knock on his door in the very early hours this morning, waking him up to share the news. Now together, the insights by Professor Will Wilson and Mil uh, Milgram into bidding and pricing have become integral to our modern economy. They've applied their discoveries to real world market problems designing new and better auction formats for complex situations, including in industries like oil, ind industrial chemicals, and power. Most notably, they pioneered the auction design for governments to allocate radio frequencies, which has been adopted in countries around the world. They'll each describe their work in fuller detail in a few moments. Their accomplishments are a shining example of the ways in which fundamental discovery and its application to finding real world solutions can make enormous contributions to modern society. At Stanford, we have a steadfast commitment to fundamental research, alongside an increased focus on accelerating the application of knowledge. The work of Bob Wilson and Paul Milgram has shown it's possible from both approaches, when deep fundamental research provides a wellspring of new ideas that can also be applied to solving real world problems. Especially during this challenging time, the pursuit of knowledge for the benefit of humanity has never been more important. This win follows in a great tradition Paul Milgram and Bob Wilson are in good company. They are the 18th and 19th living Nobel laureates among Stanford's community of scholars. There have been uh, 34 total Stanford Nobel laureates. So thank you again for joining us this morning to congratulate these two remarkable scholars. I'm inspired by their work and we're all deeply grateful for their contributions. And now I'll turn it back over to Farnaz. Farnaz. Thank you, Mark. And now I would like to ask uh, Dean John Levin uh, of our Graduate School of Business to make a few remarks. John? Thank you and welcome everyone to this press conference. I am, uh, I could not be more excited for and proud of uh, both Paul Milgram and Bob Wilson. Like many economists, I have looked to Bob and Paul as a model of what it means to be a great scholar, a great advisor, and a great mentor. I've been their colleague here at Stanford for 20 years and friend, and in all that time, I have never gotten past the intellectual awe 
in which I hold both of them and their work. Their work, both theoretical and applied, exemplifies creativity and depth in economic theory, attention to practical problems, and power in application. If there is one shared characteristic to which I would point, it is that they both have maintained incredible intellectual vibrancy over decades. How is that? Even with all their years of accomplishments, it is always today's work that is their most exciting and energizing. Is that is the work that they wanna talk about and share and use to inspire their students and their colleagues. Every scholar should aspire to that attitude and to that ideal. This is a day that has been eagerly anticipated by all of us and I'm just so happy that it's arrived. Thank you, John. Uh, I would now like to ask Deborah Satz, the Dean of our School of Humanities and Sciences, to make a few remarks. Thank you. Uh, so um, I am also uh, simply thrilled. Uh, I couldn't be more uh, delighted by this news. Um, this is an extraordinary honor uh, for both uh, Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson. Really, it's the achievement of the pinnacle of their fields and um, we're all uh, uh, basking in your glory. Um, it's uh, a warmth that is, I think, extending over all of us. I also wanna say um, something about the Department of Economics, which has um, at the moment two uh, Nobel Prize winners now in it and uh, has produced 11 of the uh, 34 that Mark mentioned with many more people passing in and out of the department. So it's just a, a wonderful hotbed of interesting ideas uh, that really make a difference. Uh, I think one of the most important insights in recent economics has been the understanding that markets don't automatically work well and that design matters. Um, and the work of both uh, Paul and Bob has contributed to helping design uh, markets in contexts where the ordinary pricing and uh, ordinary mechanisms we have for distributing and allocating goods don't work well. Um, and what's interesting about this work, as others have uh, pointed out, it's very, it, it has an origin in ma very mathematical and theoretical insights, but then it delivers those insights to real world problems that governments and societies have been grappling with from how to distribute um, efficiently uh, telecommunications, radio bandwidth, and then many other uh, applications. Uh, I want to also call out, um, uh, echoing something uh, Dean Levin said uh, about the vibrancy of both these scholars. And um, I know, uh, uh, you know, Paul has been a community builder at Stanford from his role as a founding director of the Stanford Institute for Theoretical Economics to the many years that he and Eva, his wife, have opened their home up for numerous discussions of totally out of the box ideas where people gather over dinner and uh, exchange the most wacky thoughts, many of which go on and, uh, and change the world. So both, of, uh, both uh, Bob and, and Paul are wonderful examples of how fundamental theoretical research can have astounding applications. And we're extremely proud of both of them. And this is just a wonderful way to start the week and uh, congratulations. Thank you, uh, Deborah. Um, and, uh, and before I turn it over to professors uh, Wilson and Milgram, I'd just like to remind the media that if you have questions, please go ahead and enter them and we will be happy to get to them. 
Uh, it is now my great pleasure to introduce our newest Nobel, uh, Nobel laureates, Professors Wilson and Milgram. Hello. Well, uh, what a pleasure today, especially what makes it a special pleasure, um, besides all the friends who are here, is winning this together with Bob. Uh, Bob was my PhD dissertation advisor, um, introduced me to the study of auctions as a way to study markets and resource allocations right at the beginning of my research career. Uh, then we were able to collaborate um, in the early 1990s in the creation of the first radio spectrum auctions, which um, uh, allowed the Federal Communications Commission to efficiently uh, allocate radio spectrum for uh, mobile phone use. And, and uh, Bob and I have subsequently done many other things separately, Bob, especially in the electricity sector and, and mineral rights and so on. Uh, and we have, um, we've just had a good time together. He's across the street. We talk about ideas all the time. And, and it, I, John Levin, I think, hit the nail on the head. Part of what makes it so wonderful being a professor and, and is I'm, I'm just always excited about whatever is I'm currently working on. It's just always the way I feel. If somebody asks me, what have you done that's exciting? It's what I did yesterday. Um, and, and I always feel that way. And, and talking to Bob, who's always interested in new ideas, it's it's just wonderful. Bob, what, let me hand over to you to, so I don't monopolize things here. I want to use this oppor uh, opportunity to express sort of thanks to the university. I've been here, uh, I don't know, in, in 56 years. The university has always been very supportive of the basic research interests that I've had. And this has been really important to me because I think of uh, the work I've done on sort of basic theory, game theory, decision theory, and so on as being a fount from which has flowed these applications. So if applications have been acknowledged and they're, they're the subject of the prize, but I really feel that uh, the university plays this very special role of sustaining basic research that develops new perspectives, new ideas, gives us new insights that then lead to these applications. And uh, the university, Stanford University, has just been wonderful and always being uh, there and supportive to help this happen. Yeah, in, in terms of applications, um, Stanford University has been great and, and uh, John has worked with me on uh, applications too. And, and uh, Ilya Segal, my colleague in the economics department through my company, Auctionomics, these guys we've worked on uh, uh, and getting applications going. and, and it's been wonderful, the whole academic community actually, not just here, University of British Columbia, um, uh, universities in Madrid have uh, also contributed uh, people that have worked with me uh, on applications. But the heart of it for me is Stanford. This is my home where I've been um, for a long time now and uh, working with, with Bob and with Ilya Segal and with uh, people and John Levin. Uh, and others has been just made it possible to take these ideas and actually do something with them and 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 put them to work. By the way, mentioned there's sort of a broader spectrum. Spec <laughs> well, you shouldn't use spectrum at the same time. We're talking about spectrum auctions. A broader set of ideas, which is market design. The beyond auctions, there's a whole class of problems that are addressed by innovating. Uh, changes in, in the protocols, the procedures of existing markets, but also the design of entirely new markets. I mean, we uh, uh, cited with Zal Roth, who's done this work on uh, markets for exchange of kidneys from recipients, uh, from donors to recipients. And uh, there are many others that we could bring. I worked on a market, for example, for diamonds, of raw diamonds. Uh, you know, it's changing the way De Beers used to just hand a bag of diamonds to a dealer and say, take it or leave it. We created an auction system in uh, uh, Antwerp that supplanted a large part of the market from uh, the monopoly power of the, the dominant supplier, De Beers. So there's, there are so many of these subject areas where a different change could produce either more efficiency or less monopoly power, uh, can mitigate some of the incentive problems. So these 
these have turned out to be really fundamental in terms of improving the allocation of these resources. Now, you had mentioned, and I, I want to turn back, we've focused on applications in our conversation so far, but actually, you know, fundamental theory has played a role too, coming to understand incentives and uh, how, to, how to model them and how to represent them in order to engineer to take advantage of them. And uh, uh, even methods in computer science, it turns out that the 2016-2017 uh, the, uh, uh, broadcast incentive auction where we were uh, reallocating radio spectrum from use uh, by television broadcasters into mobile broadband use involved uh, solving some NP hard problems, problems that are uh, with, that's for those of you who don't know, that means that they're hard even for a com computer to solve. We had to devise new algorithms and integrate those into uh, uh, an economic system uh, in order to uh, clear out some uh, of the low value TV broadcasters, reallocate other broadcasters to new TV channels, clear some of that spectrum for use in uh, broadband provision. And that involved uh, the machine learning methods in terms of machine learning methods to develop new algorithms, new algorithms for solving hard problems. And that all uses fundamental research in economics and computer science to, uh, to make these things work well. And we have young colleagues, by the way, we've mentioned Al Roth, who's another Nobel laureate, but we have young colleagues who are doing this too. Mohammed Akbarpour over in the business school has also been uh, uh, working on, on kidney markets and, um, and you know, others as well. So uh, it's really been an exciting environment to be working in. Great, so we have some questions for you uh, that uh, we'd love to, to have, uh, to have uh, one or both of you um, answer. And I think this first one, uh, Mark made some reference to uh, an interesting way that Professor Milgram, you found out this morning, but a question is, is can each of you describe how you learned of the news? Bob learned first, go ahead, Bob. Well, how did I learn of it? Well, I just got a phone call, uh, which uh, first of all, I didn't answer, but <laughs> hopefully they, they tried again with my wife's cell phone. And it was just a call from uh, Joran Hansen, which is who's the chair of the Nobel Committee. And then Bob came over. So they tried to call me, but uh, my phone was in do not disturb. I like to sleep at night and um, they couldn't reach me. Um, so Bob came over uh, and at 2.15 in the morning was knocking at my door and ringing my video doorbell. And I don't know if, if you know this, Bob, but when you rang my video doorbell, it not only lit up my phone, it lit up my wife's phone. My wife is in, uh, is in Stockholm right now. And she listened to you tell me that um, uh, I was a co-winner of the Nobel Prize. So she was watching the video as you were saying it here outside my door. So that's how I found out that, um, uh, that I was a co-winner with Bob. Uh, thank, thank you both for that. Um, it's good that you live across the street from each other <laughs> for that reason. So uh, a couple more questions. How can understanding auctions and finding new forms of auctions help the economy recover during this time of global weakness? Well, I might say first right off that uh, I worked with uh, uh, Axel Oxenfeld at Peter Crampton and Al Roth already in making proposals about how there could have been a more efficient allocation of protective uh, equipment, the PPE, these protective equipment for medical workers. You know, we had such a chaotic system and then if we think ahead to the next emergency about how we'd allocate scarce supplies like that, uh, I think we could make major improvements in how that allocation is done uh, to have better have, use the resources we have more effectively and acquire resources uh, adequate to the task. So that's, a, that's an example. Well, picking up on, on that example, Bob, I think all of us remember early in the pandemic, the uh, terrible disorganization we had in allocating, for example, respirators, where the states were competing against each other and simply bidding up the prices, which weren't creating more respirators, but were putting strains on the medical system. The rules of markets do matter. And in times of crisis, we don't just want prices, uh, you know, uh, going through the roof 
and uh, and straining the system uh, uh, worse. We we need well thought out systems, and part of what we do in market design is try to think about uh, uh, all the aspects of systems: uh, competition, uh, distribution, solving hard complex problems, and making sure that the systems we have in place are up to the task. Thank you. Could you say a bit more about the special challenges, both ethical and economical, around markets for organs such as kidneys? Dr. Wilson, I believe you, you mentioned that. Um, well, uh, I, I mean, it's as to what the issues are. The current issue is whether you could have transnational exchange of kidneys. Uh, Alvin Ross has worked on that and, and others have considered it. The exchange of kidneys is widely adopted uh, in the United States and many other countries and is under consideration in, in other bigger countries like India. But in, uh, in international exchange, there's the fear that somehow this could create a black market for kidneys. So that's, that represents a uh, fundamental problem. It's true that you can make both parties better off. This, there's sort of a win-win situation, it would seem, if you did not have a um, some fear of uh, creating a, a gray market, black market for kidneys. So that's, that represents very deep, fundamental ethical uh, considerations in the, in the design of that market. So if, if I can amplify Bob's remarks a bit, I remember Deborah Satz here being at uh, talking about this subject with Al Roth in my home. Deborah was referring to these evenings we had uh, talking about topics. This was one of the topics when uh, Al and she were talking about uh, uh, these kidney exchanges and, and the grave dangers that some of them pose. We know that often in, in around the world, the sellers of kidneys are poor people who are desperate for money, possibly coerced by money lenders into uh, selling organs when they really wouldn't want to do that. Um, there, you know, there's grave danger that children could be forced to uh, to sell organs by uh, impoverished parents. We have to have controls on these markets to make sure that uh, that the benefits are not being outweighed by the costs. Now, I know that, um, again, one of John's colleagues, uh, Mohammed Akbarpour, has been looking at um, kidney, uh, the kidney market in Iran, Iran being the only country in the world where um, kidneys can actually be exchanged for money. And uh, the possibility of exchanging kidneys for money creates the kinds of problems that I just mentioned, by the way, which I learned about from Deborah. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Deborah, for teaching me about that. Um, and, and they have verified that, in fact, in that market, the average income of the sellers is much lower than the um, average income of the buyers. And sellers competing to sell kidneys keep the prices low, so it doesn't do much to alleviate poverty either. And, uh, and they've talked about interventions that involve raising, if there's going to be a kidney market, raising the price of kidneys, so at least there's... Uh, um, some reasonable deal for the poorer people who are um, in, in, a, in a place where they believe in transacting uh, organs for money. Thank you both. Uh, another question is, could you describe how your approach differs from traditional auctions? You can go first, Bob. Well, the simple-minded view of an auction is just so you have an auctioneer with a gavel. I mean, I was a boy. I would go to the uh, cattle auction on every Saturday morning, sit up in the bleachers and watch the cows be paraded in, or horse auction. Uh, and, or we, of course, we see the views of uh, art auctions. In the case of, uh, if I can take the spectrum auctions as the, as the product, prototypical example of what we're trying to address. It could have been that those licenses were auctioned one by one by a single auctioneer. You know, a new, uh, there were a hundred licenses. They could be gone through one every 10 minutes and you could get the whole thing done in a short time. We took a longer time to be very careful to try and avoid what you could have with your acquiring them one by one. It could be that you're trying to assemble a, a northern and assemble 
two licenses that cover both Northern and Southern California. But if they come up in sequence, let's think of it as separated considerably in time, it could be that you acquire one and then find that it's too expensive to acquire the second, in which case you wish you hadn't bought the first. So there's, these are the cases in which the Northern and Southern California licenses are complements in providing coverage in the state. And so our auction was designed to enable the assembly of efficient packages. And this is not the kind of a problem that you run into in, uh, you know, cattle being paraded one by one through the auction ring to uh, have, uh, you know, the local farmers bid on. This is not that kind of thing. These are not single item things that have, don't have complementarities. I guess it could be, you can imagine a horse auction where you want to acquire two members of a good team or oxen or whatever, but uh, no, we're talking about these properties that have fundamental complementarities. Okay, well, I'll just add two or three examples to what Bob, Bob has sort of laid out one of the uh, most important features that when ordinary people think about auctions, they think about selling things one at a time. You bid some money, somebody wins, and it's over. Whereas most of the auctions we've worked on involve the interaction among multiple things. So uh, for example, Bob's done a bunch of work in electricity auctions. If you have somebody who's selling electrical power and they're trying to uh, sell power during the peak part of the day, well, you can't just turn the generator on and off so that it's on during the peak part of the day and um, many generators need some ramp up time. They need to be on after they ramp down time. They need to be on before and after. And you have to consider that in uh, organizing the system or in the fisheries auctions in New South Wales, you were um, for environmental reasons, they were reducing the size of the catch and they, um, uh, and, and what we were trying to do is get some fishermen to exit the fishing industry and the fishermen who were exiting don't want to sell just one or two rights to buy uh, pieces of the catch. If they're exiting, they want to sell the entire package, all of the rights they have as a bundle. And so they're not interested in selling these pieces individually. So in general, there, there are many auctions that occur in the world where there's lots of things that are interacting. And the, uh, the auction can't be just a, a one by one purchase or sale of any individual piece. It has to take into account the uh, how they interact in the whole system. And, and Bob was giving one example of that, and I've just added a couple more. Great, thank you. Um, another question, is it fair to say that in a well-designed market, goods don't necessarily flow to the highest bidder? Well, <laughs> depends on how it's organized. Certainly if it's organized as a traditional auction, you would expect it to go to the highest bidder. Um, so I'm a little bit confused about what the question's intended to say, if it's officially organized. So uh, the highest bidder, I mean, we're talking about a criterion of whether you want to have revenue or efficiency. And, um, you know, on efficiency grounds, it need not be that you want it to go to the highest bidder. Yeah, there can be times when you don't want it to go to the highest bidder, but even uh, the, the question presumes there is such a thing as the highest bidder for an item. And what we've tried to explain previously is it's not about selling one item at a time and asking about what it is worth. It's asking about what it is worth as part of a combination of items. And, uh, and so it makes it hard to answer a question which presumes that there is a, you know, a highest bid for an individual item. We're, we're really interested in the, uh, in the whole system. So uh, that's a sense in which um, the question is too simple. Thank you. Many people participate in auctions in some form or another, even if it's just on eBay. What useful tips from your research could you share with us to better uh, understand for auctions for buyers and sellers? Yeah, so the, the kinds of auctions that Bob and I have been emphasizing are not like the auctions on eBay. The auctions on eBay are mostly exactly what you guys are thinking about what m most of the populace thinks about. I'm out there to buy a television set, one item, I buy it or I don't. I'm not looking to buy a whole collection of things that uh, especially fit well together. Um, so we, we don't really have any tips for people who are participating in, um, in auctions as simple as that. Well, not much. 
There are, um, <laughs> I can tell you from time to time, stories about uh, badly designed auctions for single items that um, we've managed to exploit the rules. But uh, those are special cases, and I think I'll keep them private. Thank you. Could you address how your insights could inspire the design of carbon emission trading and renewable energy markets? Uh, well, I might do, but some of it's already been applied. I mean, what we have um, already implemented in the case of uh, acid rain are markets for emission rights. And uh, those are based upon you know, quotas decreasing over time to reduce the emissions of uh, acid-causing sulfides. So um, this, is a, this is an existing example. It's been there for, I think, 20, over 20 years. It's been very successful. Um, there are these, uh, you know, other markets for various kinds of uh, either limitations on emission, because of quotas, but they're also a way of establishing uh, in effect, a shadow tax on uh, the emission of carbon, which can, which can reduce then overall in the long run uh, the, the amount of carbon that's emitted. Great. Thank you. So I, maybe I should have, at least so people should realize, there is a political argument that goes on as to whether this so-called cap and trade market, like for uh, acid rain emission permits. Um, should it be done that way or should there be a tax on the emission of carbon? So I was not taking a position <laughs> as to uh, which is the better one. I was just saying uh, if, uh, if you had a cap and trade system, it puts an implicit price on, on, the, uh, on carbon just as if you could have a direct tax on carbon. Thank you. Another question, what is the ultimate goal of creating better auctions? Well, the goals that we have when we're designing auctions uh, depend on the client. Um, it, it, at the Federal Communications Commission, what we were trying to do in this recent large auction I spoke about is accelerate the deployment of uh, fifth generation wireless technology. We have Spectrum that is currently being used for satellite downlink or currently being used for broadcast television and is unavailable to use for uh, what we think are more valuable technologies. And we're trying to make that happen fast. And in order to make it happen fast, you have to compensate the people who are losing something. And what we uh, achieve through the auction is uh, compensation that people are willing to accept. Uh, competition among them keeps the prices reasonable and lets us do a much faster transition than a political process and to do it efficiently, putting the, uh, uh, taking off the air, the uh, TV stations with the lowest economic values, uh, putting the spectrum for mobile broadband in the hands of the people with the, with the highest economic values. And, uh, and again, doing it all uh, in a time frame that is much faster than any political process could hope to achieve. So that's, that's an example of, um, uh, you know, of what we might be trying to do. Thank you. What unexpected use of your auction theory have you found most surprising? It's a hard question. I have um, uh, sometimes worked with some local uh, tech companies about uh, auctions for internet advertising and found the, uh, and, and also in the auctions that I spoke to you earlier, and what I have found surprising um, compared to what I understood 10 and 20 years ago, 10 and 20 years ago, I didn't know any computer science. And um, some of these problems just seemed too hard to do. And the, the, the things that I've learned from computer scientists and the ability to integrate uh, ideas about algorithms with ideas about economics, I have found that surprising. It's hard to, to uh, pick out something that I can describe to you uh, to speak about without getting extremely technical. But the, but the ability to integrate uh, advances in other fields with economic ideas to create things that actually work well, that's been fun and surprising and something that I've really enjoyed doing. Farnaz, if I might add an example of, of, 
a few years ago, I was teaching a class in market design, a class originally designed by Paul, and I was teaching uh, Bob and Paul's uh, method that they used for the FCC to allocate the original radio spectrum rights back in 1994, the simultaneous ascending auction. I had some MBA students in the class at that time, and uh, they used their auction to allocate the rooms within their shared house. So they were, it was a nice example of deep and high level uh, auction theory designed for a uh, a major many billion dollar auction being used to, uh, for a very local uh, but very salient uh, problem for our students. Thanks, John. That's a great example. Um, all right, another question. When you mentioned a better allocation of PPE, uh, personal protective equipment, how would auctions help? Would this result in wealthy purchase, uh, purchasers getting more PPE at the expense of others? That was not the way it was intended to be put together. So uh, one system that uh, we discussed is one in which the government allocates on the basis of projected needs, such as, for example, the prediction is uh, uh, based upon, um, say, the number of possible patients that would arrive at a hospital. So that's the initial allocation. A market can help by then you allowing hospitals to exchange PPE among themselves to improve efficiency. Different aspects of you know, PPE, it could be respirators or masks or gowns or whatever. So um, in fact, this is even sometimes done in uh, some programs with an artificial currency. That there's an artificial currency that can only be used by the hospitals for exchanging PPE equipment, but then given the initial allocation, they can dynamically reallocate by exchanging among themselves. Yeah, and I get uh, emphasized that, as Bob mentioned, the artificial currency is something that we put in to make sure that it's not a matter of just the wealthiest uh, people getting all of the resources. It's something to promote efficient allocation of resources among the parties that participate while still having some control over uh, equity issues. Thank you. Maybe a last question. Uh, do either of you personally participate in auctions? Well, I, again, um, for me, um, I have uh, Auctionomics, this uh, a company that I founded with a big team, and we participate in auctions, in multi-billion dollar auctions. Sometimes the auctions are not auctions we've designed, but auctions we're bidding in. And um, we are, for example, will be helping a bidder trying to in the uh, Rural Opportunity Fund that's coming up later this month, where the government is procuring services so that uh, we will be able to supply broadband services to people that live in remote areas. Uh, we'll support a bidder who wants to provide those services. And yeah, we do analysis and, and uh, strategizing to participate. And that's a pretty complicated auction. There's more than 60,000 areas that are being sold uh, being procured for which uh, services are being procured all at one time and uh, uh, bidding for a combination that makes sense for uh, for the bidders and trying to uh, win support to provide those services. That's something that that's the kind of thing we do routinely. But I don't participate in auctions at all. I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm a, only an observer. Wonderful. Um, I want to thank you both for your time um, and uh, to congratulate you again for this wonderful honor, well-deserved, uh, and all of your incredible accomplishments. I would also like to thank all of our speakers uh, this morning. And on behalf of everyone at Stanford, I wanna thank each of you for joining us for this very happy occasion today. And I wish you all a very good day. Thank you very much.